And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My very special guest is someone that for most of you needs no introduction. But for those who don't know him, he is Daryl Anka, writer, director, and producer at Zia Films, who has an extensive background in miniature effects, storyboards, and set design. He has worked on some of the biggest sci-fi and action films over the past 30 years, such as Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, probably everyone's favorite Star Trek movie, Iron Man, and Pirates of the Caribbean at World's End. And he is also the world-renowned channeler of the non-physical being from the future known as Bashar. Daryl, thank you so much for joining me and welcome. It is my pleasure. Thank you so much. I deeply appreciate being on your show. Um, A couple of things about that. Bashar, as far as we know, does actually have physicality. Oh, wow. Physical ET. Um, But he's quasi-physical where he has a lot of the traits of non-physical beings, a lot of the traits of spirit. Um, But, and, you know, I've been channeling this entity for the last 40 years, this month, actually. Mm -hmm. Daryl, I feel like this channel is about guests sharing their paranormal and supernatural experiences. And you have seen two UFOs. Can you tell us about your UFO sightings? Absolutely. Uh, This is back in 1973. And some friends of mine and I and and family were driving back into the San Fernando Valley from West L.A. And there's a a hotel in the distance that you can see for quite a while when you're coming down the freeway grade. And there were these lights hovering over the hotel. It was just before dusk. And as the driver, I'm noticing these lights before anyone else. And I just noticed that they're not moving. And I thought, well... You know, maybe it's an illusion of the way the plane is moving and the way we're driving, and it makes it look like it's not actually moving. But as I kept driving closer to it, I could really tell it wasn't moving. So I thought, okay, well, maybe it's a helicopter, but why is this helicopter hovering over this hotel? So the more we got closer to it, I started drawing everyone's attention to it, and everyone started looking. And it became obvious pretty quickly that it wasn't a plane, it wasn't a helicopter. It was this dark black equilateral triangular craft with blue white lights on its points and a dull orange red one underneath in the center. And we suddenly were shocked to realize we're just looking at a UFO hovering over this hotel that was about maybe 20, 30 feet across and about 150 feet up because it was just above the hotel which was a 12-story building so we passed it and we're all marveling at this and it actually moved from one side of the freeway to the other side when so it was on our left to begin with and now as we were going around the interchange and heading in a different direction it was on our left again and this thing just took off over the valley like it was riding on a sheet of glass it was super smooth made no noise, and we were all just kind of freaking out that we had seen this thing, and we all started talking about it. But the weirdest thing is that one week later, I was in West Los Angeles, and we were stopped at a traffic light with one of the same friends that was with me in the first sighting. And either, you know, again, what we thought at the time was either an identical ship or the same ship came floating across the the road like it was only like 60 70 feet up and it literally crossed over the street and went over this residential section and we we're kind of looking at each other stunned because we're going what again one week later what's happening here are we being invaded what's going on so i just like took off after it i turned right <clears throat> and i went into the neighborhood There's a lot of trees, so it was a little hard to follow because it was kind of zigzagging over the neighborhood. And my friend was leaning and she was leaning out the window, riding shotgun and kind of saying, turn right, turn left, it's over there. So I would be zigzagging through the neighborhood trying to follow this thing. And after a while, we kind of lost sight of it. And just on impulse, I decided to turn right down this one residential street. And she just suddenly yelled, stop the car. And I slammed on the brakes 
and we looked up and this thing was like right above the car just about 60 feet up and it disappeared straight up into the clouds in the blink of an eye and we got out and we're looking around and it was so surreal because there wasn't a person out on the street there was no one watering their lawn no one walking their dog there was no one around except us having seen this thing so from that incident both of them i started wanting to know what's this all about because you know we were always told well these things aren't real but when you see something like that physically you suddenly realize the world is not what you thought <laughs> these things are real and it just completely turns your world upside down so i started doing a lot more research looking for books about ufos and so on and so forth and especially back then in the early 70s there weren't a lot of metaphysical books in a bookstore <clears throat> they had like everything on one shelf that was called the occult section and so i kind of went down the line and there were books there on psychic functioning and esp and and i came across uh the seth material the channel material by jane roberts and just started educating myself on all of this stuff so 10 years after the sightings I was introduced to a channel who was doing seminars at the time. And I thought, okay, I'm going to go listen to this. <clears throat> and the information coming through, I thought was very helpful, very interesting. And a few months after I had been attending these seminars, the entity coming through that channel offered to actually teach a channeling class. And I thought, okay, I'm going to go into this just to further my research. I didn't think I was going to become a channel because I always thought it was something that sort of just happened to you. I didn't know how channeling could be taught to you. So I wanted to understand what this process was. And it was a series of guided meditations to put you in different altered states. And about halfway through the course, about six weeks in, <clears throat> um, we were in a meditative state, we were being guided by the entity. And suddenly I just received what I can only describe as a telepathic connection from Bashar. And it was like a memory came back of having made an agreement before this life to do this with him. I understood in that second that the UFO had been shown to me on purpose by him to get me to start investigating, to start learning what this was all about, so that when it came time to do the channeling, I would be better prepared. And the message that was there in my head was, <clears throat> you know, along with an image of his face was, now you know it's time to begin if this is something you still want to do. Well, all of this happened like in a split second, like somebody just sort of shoved a DVD into my head. And the second that this happened, I wasn't saying anything out loud. And the entity stopped talking to the class and turned right to me and said, hey, there's an entity here for you right now if you're ready to begin. And I opened my eyes and I happened to glance behind me and another class member happened to, I guess, pick up on the same image I saw in my head. And she was literally sketching the image of Bashar's face on a piece of paper. So I already had two sort of outside validations that this wasn't just my imagination. It wasn't a hallucination, uh, that something real was happening. And so I thought, okay, I'll continue to practice in the class. And eventually the uh, teacher asked me to co-channel the next class with him which is actually where I also met my wife. <laughs> and eventually a woman named Margot Chandley came along and said that she was doing a college thesis paper on the connection between psychology and channeling and she needed uh, basically subjects to study. So I went to her house as one of her subjects and I would channel to her friends and she would write her notes and, and write her paper. But the first week was kind of like five friends. And then the next week there were 10 friends and they would tell others and then there were 20 friends and it just started growing and they made recordings and shared them with people. <clears throat> it got to different people in different cities. It finally got to people in different countries. And I started getting invitations to go and channel in different places around the world. And here I am 40 years later, still doing it. And that's sort of in a nutshell, how it grew. Do you have that? picture that that woman drew of Bashar? I don't have the original. Uh, I actually had to recreate it myself. We did a documentary called First Contact about my channeling experience and about who Bashar is. So we sort of recreated the class scenario and I recreated what I remembered she had drawn 
on a piece of paper, but no, I don't have the original, unfortunately. Well, that would be cool. Yeah. What does he look like? Well, he's what's classically referred to as a hybrid being. They're about five feet tall, a combination of an earth human and what people refer to as the greys. So it's sort of human, but um, more extreme. The head is a little larger than ours. The eyes are much larger. Ears and mouth and nose are smaller. They're relatively thin. Uh, their skin is kind of palish white. Uh, the males have no hair. The females do have hair. It tends to be white and sort of wispy. Um, so they're relatable as humanoid, but they're not exactly what we recognize as a human. So a cross between us and the greys. Do you ever have visual contact with him in dreams? I do. I've had about four or five that stand out as absolute conversations. Uh, and that's all that's happening in the dream. And it has that other quality to it that is very coherent, like I'm having a conversation with you right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and there have been a few very interesting things that have happened in those dream encounters, of which I'm assuming are taking place in a slightly altered reality. Uh, in one, I was able to see the inside of the scout craft that he showed to me. Um, which was very streamlined, very clean, almost sparse. Uh, and I, one of the coolest things I noticed is there was another, he was standing to one side, and I noticed there was another <clears throat> member of his species sitting at what I took to be a control console, but I couldn't see anything on the console. It looked like it was just completely blank, made out of this sort of whitish crystalline metallic substance like everything else in the ship. Uh, and he explained, well, the pilot is in telepathic contact with the intelligence of the ship, and therefore only the pilot can see the controls, and they interact with that in a telepathic way. So I thought, well, that's very interesting and efficient. No one else can fly that ship except the pilot that is keyed to it. And in another dream encounter, I, I kind of had the question, you know, that everyone has is like, well, you know, why don't you land? on earth and show everyone that you're real <clears throat> and he said um in the dream i'll show you why that doesn't happen and so in the dream i saw his ship come down i saw him get out and i saw him walk toward me and when he got to be about 20 feet away i actually lost my sense of identity and i saw my body through his eyes and i i felt myself jerk back and he said that's why he said our vibrational frequency is so much higher and so overwhelming to you that it could actually cause you to lose your sense of self in us until you're more evolved and more ready to interact with us and sort of hold on to your own identity. So we have to be very careful about how we interact with humanity because our frequency would just overwhelm you right now because you're operating on a much lower vibration. He kind of likened it to taking a, a fast spinning gear and a slow spinning gear and trying to mash them together without synchronizing their movement. He said you could just strip the gears. So we're giving you this information uh, as a way of initiating first contact with your civilization, but we want to see what you do with the information. We don't want to reveal ourselves because we're not the important thing. The important thing is you. And if you are willing to adapt to the information we're sharing with you into your lives so you can evolve yourselves to a point where you can meet us halfway. Um, so that was a very interesting dream encounter. People who regularly watch this podcast will know that I almost never give my opinion. But today I will say that you are my favorite channeler. And I watch you the most out of anybody. And I think you're the best on the planet. Oh, my God. Thank you. And you come at my feed quite often. And um, speaking of Bashar's appearance, I think one of the coolest things that you or Bashar, and it's kind of funny for me. Do I, I'm not sure how I address you or Bashar as a third person. I'm kind of wavering back and forth on how to, to ask these questions. But... I loved it when you had Bashar wear an alien mask. <laughs> I thought that was brilliant. Yeah, it was an exercise in getting people used to the idea of actually interacting with them mm -hmm. closer to the way they actually look. 
uh, just again, sort of, you know, getting getting people familiar with the idea of something other than themselves. Yeah, I think that was exercise. that was so cool. A lot of times on the show, we talk about that on the other side, the past, the present, and the future are all happening at the same time. So, is it possible that you are Bashar? in the future. Yes, he's actually said that's a linear way to look at it. You could look at it as the same soul in two different time planes that have the ability to interact with each other because everything does exist at the same time. So it doesn't take away from the autonomousness of my identity or his identity, but he has the capability based on where they're at in their evolution of of being able to connect to other versions, let's say, of the soul uh in other timelines so yes that's one way it could be looked at when you are channeling are you aware of what's going on i don't really hear exactly what's happening i know there's an interchange happening i know there's an exchange going on a communication happening but what i'm experiencing is so much more overwhelming than the conversation which is a very secondary level of a translation of his thoughts so <clears throat> I, I sometimes liken it to the idea that I'm getting all this energy. I'm getting images. Time is really compressed for me. Uh, I can feel the emotionality. I can feel what he feels. And it's the energetically, it's sort of like I liken it to sort of standing under a pounding waterfall. The audience is getting the spray. I'm getting the initial feed. And when someone asks a question, the entire answer is there in a in the blink of an eye. But it takes time for it to unspool into our language because he's not speaking English. He's just sending thoughts. And I'm programmed with English. That's how I was raised. And so it takes time for my brain to make sense out of how to unspool that into a translation that makes sense for the audience that's listening. But I'm experiencing this in a very time-compressed way so that I'm getting these flashes of concepts, whole concepts. I'm getting imagery of um, like symbolic kind of forms and shapes that Bashar says is in and of itself a kind of language that they've learned to read that tells him what he needs to know about the person he's talking to. Sort of like certain patterns and imagery stand out to him and that's what lets him know what he can and can't address with this person. Um, so it's a really dynamic daydream kind of state of being. I, and, and the, the words themselves are very secondary. It might as well be a conversation that somebody is having in another room somewhere. You know how, like when you're in a deep daydream and somebody walks in the room and maybe they have to call your name like three times before, you know, someone's talking to you. It's kind of like that. I'm so focused on the experience I'm having that I can't really pay attention to the actual translation that someone else is getting without breaking the connection with him. Well, it's amazing how quickly this process works because Bashar's answers are like seamless in time. Another thing yeah. I want to say real quick is that what I love about Bashar is he is an amazing listener because there is not one comment from the questioner that goes by him he comments on everything yeah when we did first contact the documentary about the channeling one of the things we wanted to do with that was to demystify the whole concept of what channeling is about because everyone actually channels at times when they're in the zone when they're doing what they love to do they go into a channeling state which is a brainwave state that's called gamma between 40 and 100 cycles per second and what we wanted to do is we wired up my head with an EEG machine in the documentary so that we could really see, is there differences in my brain between when I'm awake and acting normally as myself and when I'm channeling? And we discovered some profound differences. And one of them, as you just pointed out, is that there are significant changes in my brain when Bashar is speaking, but there are even more significant changes when he's listening. He actually listens with more intensity than he speaks. So you're right, the EEG actually demonstrated scientifically that there is a higher frequency going on in my brain when Bashar listens than when he speaks. Mm. So yeah, 
very focused. It's amazing that you're saying that you're in gamma because mm -hmm. I thought that when most people are in gamma, they're almost kind of in a euphoric state. And I am. You are. <laughs> channeling. Absolutely. I get to feel what they feel like. And I think one of the most profound things I learned early on in the channeling that's so different from the way humans are is there isn't, it's like they know what they know so strongly. There isn't one shadow of a second of doubt in their minds about what they're saying. It's something they live to the fullest. And having absolutely no doubts in your mind is profoundly different than the way most humans exist where they're doubting themselves all yeah. the time so to get to feel what that feels like has really made a profound difference in my life in terms of the way i apply his information and the encouragement to move forward in acting on my own passions in life has come from that sense of certainty and conviction that they have about what they're telling us. I'm glad you mentioned that because I wanted to know if Bashar has had any effect on you as a filmmaker, which is something you're yeah. passionate about. Yeah, well, uh, all the things that I do um, uh, really has come from the encouragement uh, of that. Now, you know, as an artist, uh, I've I've sort of always gravitated in that direction, but I think channeling Bashar has certainly helped me understand that by following your passion it really can support you it always has in my life but you have to have the understanding and the conviction that that's possible for you you can't have the you know the fear and the doubt about whether or not you can be supported by the things you're passionate about so if you're really honest and truthful to yourself and authentic about what it is that really represents your core frequency and the expressions in life that are true for you, um, you know, according to what Bashar has taught us and according to what I've experienced in life, it's something that really can carry you forward and allow you to keep being supported in whatever way you need to, to continue to be able to act on all the opportunities that come to you in life that are representative of your truth and your passion. I believe all beings evolve and even Bashar can evolve. So Absolutely. over the four decades that you've been with him, have you seen him evolve? Yes. And the first way I've seen that is not so much that he's evolving, but the idea that the channeling is evolving, the connection is evolving, the ability of him to share more with us and in a more fluid way has evolved over the 40 years to the point where now it's easy for me to talk about his principles as myself. I can kind of get into my own channeling flow when I talk about these things as I'm talking about them with you. I understand his principles. I understand how to apply them. Uh, and it makes a big difference in what I experience in my life. How he himself is evolving, uh, I know he's talked about the idea that they also have their own mentors from civilizations and races that are farther along than they are. Now, he himself in his civilization is what he calls a first contact specialist. He is specifically passionate about making contact with different civilizations, initiating contact, starting dialogues, seeing whether or not uh, those civilizations like our own might eventually join the gathering or collection or alliance of other civilizations that he belongs to uh, or is in association with. Uh, and that's his passion. And, and so I know that <clears throat> one of the ways he's evolved is by sharing with us some of the experiences he's had in contacting civilizations that are extremely unlike his and ours, and has forced him to really um, grow and perceive reality in a variety of different ways based on the differences he experiences and encounters in some of these different civilizations. So I understand that he's always evolving and always growing and always changing based on his experiences in encountering these multitudes of different civilizations that behave in ways that we can't even sometimes imagine. So it really stretches their concept of consciousness 
and all the different ways that consciousness can be expressed, you know, within existence, within creation. If we step back and look at the big picture, we come here, but we come here with amnesia. Mm -hmm. And we probably come here with a purpose for lessons or, or whatever. But it's such a paradox because sometimes we never discover our lessons or discover our purpose. Does Bashar ever talk about that? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, his fundamental uh, suggestion about what our purpose is, is to be ourselves, to be our authentic selves, to remember who we are. By forgetting who we are, we can discover a new idea of ourselves. We can discover a new perspective of ourselves. And from his point of view, that's how creation grows. Because basically, he's saying that the structure of existence never changes. It is what it is. It's our relationship to it, our experience of it, our perspective of it that changes. And that's how creation expands. And so the purpose of forgetting who we are is what allows us to go through the experience of a process of change, a process of growth, a process of discovering something new about ourselves from a new point of view. Um, and so that's basically the purpose of why we create these physical experiences. It's, it's interesting as a paradox because he's basically saying, look, you are and everyone is a spiritual being. That's your natural state. And you don't actually ever leave spirit. We're in spirit right now, according to him. But we're kind of dreaming that we're not in spirit. We're pretending that we're not in spirit. And that's what he calls physical reality. It's a dream that we're having in spirit that we're not in spirit anymore, but we are. And so it's a device that our consciousness uses to impose upon itself the possibility of discovering something new, of having surprise and revelation. Because when you're in a timeless state in spirit and you know everything, there's really no change. There's, there's no process of discovery. So we create this framework for our consciousness so that we can experience newness and discovery and creation and growth. Uh, so it's a unique way that the spirit has of expanding creation through this device of what we call the projection of consciousness into physical reality experiences. It's interesting that he mentioned that about dreams because a lot of near-death experiencers will say that the other side is reality and this is the dream. Exactly. Bashar has often commented on the paradox of, you know, we go to sleep at night and we have these very realistic dreams you know, and then we wake up in the morning and go, oh, yeah, that was no matter how real that dream seemed, this is who I really am. And Bashar saying it's just the opposite. It's like, this is the dream. And when we cross over into spirit, when we die, it's kind of like waking up and going, well, that seemed very real, but this is who I really am. And that was the dream. So, yeah. Does Bashar ever talk about NDEs and their purpose? Well, he does. Uh, and it can be different purposes for different people based on the themes that they're exploring. Sometimes it's for the purpose of just making a reconnection and remembering that we are spiritual beings so that we change our lives according to that recognition. It's part of our awakening process. It's part of our evolutionary process to touch back in and remember that that's who we really are. Uh, it can also enhance, as, as many NDEers say, when they come back, they might have new abilities like psychic functioning, ESP, more awareness. <clears throat> they certainly a lot of times want to be of more service to humanity to help with our evolution. So I think it's one of the ways in which humanity is sort of upgrading itself, uplifting itself by having this moment of awakening and remembering this is who I really am. And when I reconnect to the idea of the physical dream, I now know that it doesn't have to be this experience of struggle and strife and suffering. It can be something of beautiful service. It can be something that really is an expression of our greatness and our beauty and our connection to source. So I think it serves many different purposes, but that I think is the fundamental purpose is to remind us who we really are, that we're greater beings than this and what life is really all about. When you were first telling your story about the UFO experiences twice, 
my first impression was that perhaps you had an NDE that you didn't read that you don't remember. Is it possible? Anything is possible. But like you said, I don't really remember it in the same way that people who say they've had NDEs talk about them. Um, yeah, I think I'm just walking a different path. And, mm -hmm. and the experience of seeing the UFO certainly shifted my reality and certainly led me on the journey of discovering not only in my own research, but also in what Bashar is sharing with us, things that are very, very much the same kinds of things that people experience in NDEs. I just don't know that I've actually had a classic NDE in the way most people describe them. I thought perhaps, you know, maybe something as a child or an infant, because I'm seeing more and more that near-death experiencers are now starting to see UFOs. And I feel like there's some kind of fundamental energetic change in them that either they can see them or the actual UFOs can spot them on the ground. Yes, I think both of those are true. Now, I, I have to backtrack a little bit. <clears throat> uh, it is possible that I may have had an NDE when I was extremely young because uh, my parents have told me that when I was a baby, I fell into a pool and nearly drowned, and my father saved me. It's possible that I had one and don't remember it. Um, so that's entirely possible. But the thing that is important to understand, I think that you've just sort of alluded to, is there is a connection energetically between what ETs and extra dimensional beings and UFOs are really all about and what level of reality they operate on and how similar that actually is to the spirit realm. And when people have NDEs and they alter their frequency, alter their vibration, they can be exposed to that level of reality to such a degree that they come back with senses that are heightened to be able to perceive things that operate on that level. That's one of the evolutionary things Bashar has talked about is as, as we expand our consciousness, as we explore our spirituality and realize that we are spirits having a physical experience, our senses can start to perceive what was heretofore invisible to us because now we've extended them into that vibrational range. So I think there's a lot more connection between the realms and the reality that ETs and UFOs live in and the near-death experience things, I think they're not as dissimilar as people think. I think there's a lot of crossover between those two experiences. If we get back to Star Trek for a minute, I'm not sure if you've watched the newest TV show. I can't remember what it's called. Strange uh, New Worlds? Uh, no, it's the one before that. There's like a new ship and they travel. In Discovery. Discovery. Okay, so they're traveling. They have this new warp drive where they shift into consciousness and they travel right. through consciousness. Right. And I'm glad that they did that because I feel like that's really where the way UFOs would probably travel these distances is they would get into a different realm and travel yeah. instantly and pop back out. Exactly. And Bashar has actually described this very clearly. Um, <laughs> from their point of view, the way he sort of introduced this idea is, you know, we think of an object as existing in a location. From their point of view, the concept of location exists in the object. In other words, objects, anything is made up of energy. Energy has a certain frequency pattern, let's say. You can look at it as an energy equation. And somewhere in that energy equation, is the variable that determines where they are in space and time. So he's saying if you can isolate that variable of where an object exists in space and time and change that variable to a different location, then the object has to stop existing at location A and without traveling the intervening distance, just literally start existing at location B. So it does pop out here and pop in there. And the way that their technology has advanced, they've learned to do that with their entire ships and their crews within them, is they literally redefine where they are in space and time 
and instantly leave where they were and appear where they need to be according to the new locational variable they have imposed upon the ship and the crew. So it's very much like using the concept of the consciousness field, because if everything does exist here and now, then the idea of traveling to another location is really nothing more than shifting your frequency to be representative of that location, because that location is also here and now. And it's very much connected, I think, with the quantum mechanical concept that's called entanglement, which, you know, as if your uh, viewers are not quite familiar with that, <clears throat> scientists have now discovered that two particles that are created in such a way as to be opposites of each other, let's just say one spins up and one spins down, for lack of a better term, and they go shooting off in opposite directions. They have discovered that no matter how far apart those particles are, if you alter the spin of one, the spin of the other is automatically compensating and becomes the opposite. And that's happening faster than it's possible for information to travel from one to another at the speed of light. So they're calling this entanglement. And it was Einstein's objection to this because he said, well, you know, he didn't like the idea that you can have this spooky action at a distance. But I think from Bashar's point of view, Einstein was right. The idea of entanglement of these two distant particles is not an indication that spooky action at a distance is real. It's an indication that distance is an illusion and mm -hmm. that these things are actually in the same place, basically connected to one another. And therefore, there is no distance to cover in terms of what one particle, quote unquote, knows the other particle is doing. So from Bashar's perspective, everything is here and now. And it's just a matter of making a shift in your frequency that determines how you experience your location in space and time. Are you aware of the Israeli general or former general that said that, you know, there's a galactic federation out there? And 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 but what he also said was very intriguing to me is that space is not what you think it is. Right. What do you think it is? <laughs> well, I, again, I think it's a projection of consciousness for us to experience the idea of change and, you know, time. Time is a side effect, according to Bashar. And the way he explains it is... <clears throat> It's a side effect of our consciousness shifting through billions of parallel realities every second. So he sort of uses the analogy of a film strip where you have all the different frames already exist on the film strip. But from the point of view of watching a movie, you only see one frame at a time as it's illuminated by the projector. So that's our consciousness. And our consciousness is the projector light illuminating one frame at a time to create this sequence of change and growth and discovery and newness. But we know, as with the film strip, all the frames exist for a movie all at the same time. We have just chosen to have this experience where we're only seeing them one at a time. So when you project onto a movie screen, the idea of any single image on a frame, and then you project them in sequence, you're creating this illusion of space and time and movement and volume and distance and change. You get into the idea of seeing this story unfold as if it's in three-dimensional space, but it's not. It's just this two-dimensional projection on the screen. So he's likening the idea of physical reality to a projection of consciousness in a certain way upon the inner screen of our awareness. And we create this illusion of physical reality around us, but it's not really around us, it's within us. So to me and to him, space and time are experiences we're having within our consciousness. There really is nothing out there. That's just an illusion, a reflection like a mirror. You know that when you see your reflection in a mirror, you're not really over there. It's being reflected back to you. So he's saying physical reality is kind of similar in nature. Everything's happening within us. And we just have this idea that to create this ability to experience change in the way that we do, we need this 
sense that there's a volume to it, that there's time to it, that there's change to it. But that's all happening within our consciousness. So if we think about three dimensionals, that's height, width, and depth. So if you add the fourth dimension, would that be time? And then the fifth is location? Well, the fifth is non-physical, and that's starting to take you into higher dimensional realms where you're not quite um, bound by space and time in the same way. You can kind of see beyond it. You can see multiple things simultaneously. You can see all the frames at once instead of one at a time. So it kind of takes you out of the normal time and puts you into a more timeless state, mm. as I understand it. Mm. Wow. You've been doing this for 40 years. So do you ever see the lines blurring between Bashar and you? Yes, in certain ways. Like I said, you know, I understand his concepts now uh, very clearly and at least as clearly as I possibly can. Mm -hmm. And I have started to teach classes of his material as myself because it affords an opportunity to get more deeply into the material. Whereas, you know, when Bashar does a session, it's like, you know, one and a half to two hours and it covers many different subjects. And so people don't get a chance to really dive as deeply into an understanding of the material as they might want to. So I'm been creating a series of classes that I will probably start doing in the next year or so where we can spend literally weeks talking about how do you apply Bashar's information in your physical reality to get an effect? How do you understand what he's talking about more deeply to make it ingrained within you in a way that becomes, you know, not only second nature, but first nature? Um, so uh, I, in a sense, then become my version of him by going into a channeling state as myself to talk about these things. Do you think it's possible that our consciousness is a non-local entity outside of our body and basically we're channeling all the time? We are channeling our personality all the time because our personality is a construct. It's a projection of our consciousness for a certain purpose for a certain experience. So absolutely, we're maintaining the channeling of our personality. I think this is one of the reasons, as Bashar has kind of explained it, it's kind of why you know physical reality isn't real, is because what is real from his perspective never deteriorates. Physical reality deteriorates. It's something that has to be maintained. And therefore, this is one of the reasons he says you go to sleep at night is you're reconnecting with your spirit and sort of recollecting your energy so that when you wake up, you have the energy to continue to maintain the illusion of physical reality because it isn't real. It's something you have to perpetuate. And the way you know it's not real is that physical reality dissolves and deteriorates over time because he's saying that which is real is eternal and that which is not real deteriorates. It's an illusion. It fades. So, <clears throat> yeah. I do think that the idea of us developing more awareness of what we are as greater beings, from Bashar's perspective, it's not that our consciousness is in our body, it's that our body is in our consciousness. It's the opposite. Has he ever spoke about how long it would take for us, as we are now, to evolve to get to his level? Yes. He has been very specific about the idea that where we're at now and the way some people are going, not everyone, it's possible that we can shift to their level fully in somewhere between 800 to 1,000 years. Now, that doesn't mean we can't experience more acceleration in that evolution and more um experiences of that acceleration sooner but in terms of being fully where they are he said it might take about 800 to a thousand years so that means about 80 to 100 more lifetimes of coming back here maybe maybe um or just certainly watching humanity evolve over that period of time 
Now, he said a lot more things are going to happen that'll certainly break a lot of this open, <clears throat> you know, within the next few decades. Uh, there are supposed to be some profound changes coming about, about our awareness that we are not alone and how it's possible that open contact may start to happen uh, sooner than later, relatively speaking. But in the sense that he has actually said that just by way of comparing it there, civilization is about 3,000 years ahead of us. To say that we might be where they are in a 1,000 years is actually representative of a great acceleration. And a lot of it comes from the fact that they're actually helping us accelerate, that they're sharing this information with us, that they're giving the instruction manuals for how reality works. And applying that in our lives can accelerate us to have an evolution that is faster than it took them to get to that point. Does he, but I think there's some profound things coming up in the next few decades. Does he say why they're helping us? They're related to us. As a hybrid being, that's the result of the mixing of the genetic material of the greys with Earth humans. They actually are a species that are genetically connected to us. They consider us to be family. Plus, aside from that, <clears throat> they just know from experience that the more civilizations are sort of working together, uh, the easier it is for everyone, the more anyone can accelerate. There's great benefit to that kind of cooperation and community. And they see us as someone, you know, as a species that has chosen to have these profoundly challenging experiences and transform them. A lot of people on earth think that we feel like a kindergarten class. From Bashar's perspective, he has said we are a master graduating class because Earth is a tough school. And spirits who decide to have an Earth experience are powerful enough and strong enough to face the challenges and transform them. It doesn't happen all the time, but we have many chances to do that in different life experiences. And so they're looking at us as a civilization that actually can teach other civilizations how to transform and overcome great challenges because we experience such great darkness and can still transform it into light, such great limitation and can still transform it into freedom, such great negativity and can still turn it around into something positive. And he said, you don't know how many times that impacts other civilizations throughout creation. So he looks at us that way. Some of my guests talk about that we live in a simulated reality and we are trapped here, returning <laughs> over and over again. Does Bashar have any comment or has he commented on that? Yes, he says, you're not trapped, it's a choice. Now he says, sometimes the momentum of your own belief system can bring you back right away into another experience, but it's always actually a choice or it's always at least a consequence of a choice that you have made somewhere along the line. So we do have the freedom to choose, and especially nowadays, when I think we have more awareness of our consciousness, of our expanded spirituality, we're more able and more likely to know that it's a choice to experience it. Uh, in terms of the simulation, yes, he says you're not trapped, but it is a simulation, but it's our simulation. It's not a simulation coming from something else. We're creating the simulation, and that's exactly what we've been talking about. Physical reality is a projection of consciousness. It is a simulation. It's a dream, but it's ours. So he's saying, no, you're not trapped. <clears throat> and again, the idea when he talks about reincarnation, yes, you can have those experiences of what appears to be different lives. But if you understand the mechanism behind it, where everything exists at once, it means everyone exists at once. So if every life exists at the same time, you have never actually been anyone else. And you, as this person, cannot become anyone else. He's saying the way it actually works is like this. You make energetic connections to other beings that you consider to be in other time and space lines. And those connections are downloading information and experience to you that you're using in your life to aid and assist you in the same way that other people that coexist simultaneously with you, even though you might think of them as the past or the future, may be doing the same thing with you. 
making energetic connections to you to download information and energy that helps them in their particular life. But that life is going on at the same time yours is. So it's just that from a linear perspective in space and time, we experience those connections as memories. And that's why we think of them as past lives. But he's saying it's going on right now. You're making those connections constantly and they're dynamically changing all the time. So you might be plugging into someone and you might be unplugging from them as you change and need to plug into different people in different time frames to aid and assist your theme of exploration here. This is why the old chestnut of you know 50 different people saying, well, I was Cleopatra in a last life. The reason that it's possible for people to feel that they were is because all those people exist at the same time. People can, a hundred people, a thousand people can plug into Cleopatra because she still exists at the same time we do, but we have relegated her to the idea of a different frequency that we call the past. But a thousand people can plug into her and download information. And from our perspective, we treat it as a memory. And so we go, I was Cleopatra. I remember being this past life. But that's how we interpret that connection. Does Bashar make predictions? And if so, does he have anything about what's coming in the near future? He Yes, he rarely makes predictions because, again, he's saying there's no such thing really as a prediction of the future. There is a sensing of the energy that exists at the moment the prediction is made. This is kind of like taking a reading of what's happening now and saying, if you don't change this, this is where you're headed. But if it does change, then the prediction is obsolete. And sometimes making a prediction can actually render it obsolete because now you know about it and you're going, well, that's not what I prefer. Let's change the energy. It doesn't mean the original prediction was wrong. It just simply means it made itself known to the point where you can say, hey, let's take a different course. So the times, the rare times when Bashar has made a prediction, he's basically said, look, there's so much energy, so much momentum behind this in your society that it's probably unlikely to change course. It may have more than a 90 to 95 percent probability of continuing in the same direction and coming to pass. So those are the only times he's actually made a prediction. <clears throat> One of them he made, I believe it was in 1998, and this is on the recording at the time, where he did say that there was a high probability that there would be a terrorist attack in New York before the end of 2001. Obviously, that happened. He did say that... <clears throat> after the uh, that the 2016 election in this country, after that, everything would change. I believe we can say that that's true as well. Um, look at our politics, look at our society at this point that changed after 2016. Um, the latest prediction he has been willing to make has to do with open contact. And he has said that there is a high degree of probability that sometime at the end of 2026 or the beginning of 2027, there may be a major event that involves the idea of contact that would let humanity know that they're not alone. Now, the one thing he's not saying is, what causes that? Why does that come about? So I don't know if there are more positive reasons for that happening or more negative reasons for that needing to happen. But at that point, he has said it can cause a change in our mindset so that we start to understand we're not alone, so that we start to make some changes on this planet slowly but surely that would lead toward more open contact, potentially, for many people. He doesn't say that necessarily everyone will experience that because he talks about the idea when we talk about parallel realities of understanding that there are different versions of Earth, entirely different versions of Earth that coexist with our version, and that we're constantly shifting through those different versions and navigating them through them based on our frequency, our vibration, and what we're attracted to create. So there may be a lot of people that experience open contact on one version of Earth. There may be a lot of people that never experience open contact on another version of Earth. 
positive, negative, whatever we gravitate to, whatever the consequences are of the choices we are making that determine how we navigate through all of these different parallel versions of Earth to ultimately what anyone will experience on any of those different versions. So it really depends on your proactiveness, our proactiveness, everyone's proactiveness in taking actions that are more positive than negative, making more positive choices, being of service to everyone in a very positive way, but also allowing other people to make their own choices because everyone is eternal as a spirit. Everyone is infinite in that sense. Whatever someone doesn't learn in this lifetime, they have a million other ways of learning, whether they're in physical reality or not. So it's kind of like we're at a point where everything is coming out on the table. Look at all the choices, positive and negative. We're getting everything out of our system, both positive and negative, so that everyone knows, okay, I can choose this or I can choose that. Is this the kind of world I prefer or do I prefer something else? Let's do something about it. So that's in from Bashar's point of view, what's kind of going on now. He calls this era the splitting prism. It's about looking at other realities and other choices that people are making that might not be vibrationally compatible with what you prefer, but just because you're observing it doesn't mean it's affecting you in a negative way. It's almost like there's a glass wall in between and you can still see it, but it can't reach you. But you have to take the actions that are representative of the kind of world you would prefer to give people making other kinds of choices the opportunity to see in you as a living example of the kinds of choices they could be making that might be more positive for them. He is saying, however, eventually in the years to come, as those realities split, you might actually not be capable of seeing other choices beyond a certain point. You might not be capable of seeing other realities beyond a certain point. From their point of view in their evolution, he said, it actually would be a great challenge for anyone in his civilization to actually now at this point choose something negative because there's so much momentum behind the idea of the positive choices they've made for so long that they actually would have a struggle going backwards into negative energy. But he's saying here, we're having the challenge of having had negative experiences for so long that we're challenging ourselves to get into a place where all we're making are positive choices instead. And that's the great challenge of humanity at this time, is to change ourselves and transform ourselves in that direction. Can you share with us a few of your own personal favorite messages that Bashar has given? Yeah, there's one primary powerful message, and that is to be your authentic self. And he has given us this idea called the formula or the instruction manual with very simple steps in it that is representative of how they see the structure of existence and how we use it to create the reality experience we're having already, but maybe doing so unconsciously. So he boils it down and distills it down into five steps for us that allows us to more consciously use the way we create our reality so that we can create it to our advantage. And that five-step instruction manual or formula, if you will, simply is to act on your highest passion every moment, to do it for as long as you can until you can do it no longer, letting the excitement naturally wane. And when that happens, look for the next thing that contains even just a little bit more excitement or passion in it or attractiveness or curiosity and act on that next. And to do this with no insistence and no assumption about what the outcome should look like, because the truth is we really don't know what the ideal outcome should look like, to remain in a positive state no matter what manifests so we can get a benefit from it, and to constantly examine our belief systems <clears throat> to find out why we're holding on to any fear-based or negative beliefs and to learn to let them go. And when we take those five steps it activates automatically a number of different experiences like synchronicity becoming more of an organizing principle and a constant experience in our lives. It becomes the driving engine in our lives. It becomes the path of least resistance in our lives. It becomes the path of easiest support 
in our lives. It becomes the path of connecting us to all other expressions of our excitement and opportunities to express that excitement in our lives. It becomes the path of relevance in our lives, where everything that we need comes to us when we need it. And it becomes the reflective mirror that reveals to us anything within our belief system that's out of alignment with our excitement, with our truth, so that we can recognize it and learn to let it go. So taking the five steps of acting on your passion, acting on it the best you can for as long as you can, acting on it with no insistence or assumption as to the outcome, staying in a positive state no matter what, and examining your belief systems and letting go of the fear-based and negative beliefs is all that's necessary to transform your life in magical ways. He's given us this as the basic structure in terms of how we create our reality so we can do it more consciously and create the reality that is really to our benefit. When you're acting on your passion, like in sports, they say you're in the zone. Mm -hmm. Are you out of time, like out of time, space, reality for, for moments? Or so, yes. You are living more in the moment. You are in that state of the present more. And according to Bashar, all of us have had this experience. We're doing something we love to do. We do not feel the passage of time in the same way. Mm -hmm. Let's say you're doing something for a couple of hours and you look up and you realize, oh, I've been doing this for a couple of hours. It only felt like it was about 20 minutes. He is literally saying when it feels like it's only been 20 minutes, you've only aged 20 minutes, literally. So he is definitely saying time is flexible, it's malleable. And the more you live in the present, the more you become age less. And that's why people who you see who really do love what they do, who really act on their passion, always seem to have more vitality. Yes, they mature, but they always seem to have more energy and more vitality and more life in them. And they seem to live longer for the most part, because again, they're living in the moment. They're not experiencing the passage of time. And the paradox of that is they actually seem to live longer because they live healthier. They live more vibrantly. So, yes, I do believe that you don't experience the passage of time in the same way when you live in the moment, when you're doing what you love to do, when you're in the zone, as you say. Could you say that when you're in that state, you're just more pure consciousness, even though you're in this physical body, you you kind of are acting as pure consciousness. Yes, you're more aligned with your non-physical higher mind. You're working together with your physical mind and your higher mind as a whole being. You're expressing more of your greater being. So you are living more in your total conscious self. How often do you channel Bashar? Almost every day when I do private sessions. When I'm only doing public events, probably two or three times a month. All right. Well, I'm glad you mentioned public events because I have to let everybody know that you're going to be at the Disclosure Fest. What is that? Disclosure Fest Stairway to the Stars in November. So what kind of juicy things will Bashar be disclosing? Uh, this is on November 11th, I believe I'll be there. It's at the Luxor Hotel in Las Vegas. I believe it's the entire weekend, though, the 10th, 11th, 12th. Uh, Bashar will be talking about in two worlds. So he's going to actually discuss a little bit further what we talked about in terms of the spiritual quality of extraterrestrials, the dimension they really exist in, um, and how they blend the physical and the non-physical together, and how important it is, it is for us to also do the same, to meet them halfway. And that's the true basis of open contact is that we give over to more of our true conscious selves so that we can meet them on a level that they normally exist on, which is far less physical than we think and far more about the reality of consciousness itself. So he's going to be discussing that. One of your newest ventures is escape rooms. How did yeah. you get into that? <laughs> well, in coming out of the film business, <clears throat> uh, but realizing that it's very challenging to make a living doing independent films, we decided to look for something that we could do that would still use all the same skill sets. 
And we at first were exploring, uh, my wife and I, the concept of, you know, every Halloween people do haunted houses and things like that. And they're a really good business, but that's only once a year. Yeah. So we wanted something all year long. And somebody sort of, when we talked about this with a friend of ours said, well, why don't you look into doing an escape room? And we said, what's that? And so we started investigating and found out that it's an absolutely perfect marriage of the skill sets of making movies because you're building sets, you're making props, you're telling stories. But this way, your customers get to live the movie. They get to live the experience. Um, and it becomes a three-dimensional thing that you're actually creating an environment in a real space that they get to play in. And they get to find clues and solve puzzles to be able to get through this experience in a certain amount of time. It's great for team building. It's great for communication skills. It's great for problem solving skills. And it's an absolute blast to watch all the different psychologies and perspectives of the way people in the room come about solving clues and puzzles and getting through the room. So it's an extremely exciting experience. Um, and our escape room company is called Boggled. Anyone interested in looking that up can go to boggledescaperooms.com, B-O-G-G-L-E-D, escaperooms.com. We're in Calabasas in Los Angeles. And uh, we've had uh, one adventure now. We're in the process of building our second adventure in the same space. Um, anyone wanting to know more about Bashar can go to Bashar.org, B-A-S-H-A-R.org. And anyone wanting to know what else I'm doing in terms of writing books or anything like that can go to my website, which is DarylAnka.com, D-A-R-R-Y-L-A-N-K-A.com. You mentioned you have some courses coming out. When will those be ready? They will be announced at the Bashar.org website probably sometime next year. We're still... We've done one test course already that went very well, but we're still planning exactly when and where and how we're going to do these other courses. But they will probably both be in person and online, so a lot more people will be able to participate in these classes. Um, but that will be announced on the Bashar.org website when that's available. Do you have anything else that you're working on that you want us to know about? Uh, <laughs> Just all of that. I mean, I'm I'm always coming up with you know new ideas for books. I'm I'm in the middle of uh, a third book of a sci-fi series called The Shards of a Shattered Mirror, um, and the first two books are available. They can find them on my website. Um, but it's just a constant you know creative act of figuring out what's exciting to do next. So uh, again, on on one or another of those websites we will announce anything and everything that I'm, I'm up to. I keep going back to Star Trek and, um, please do. <laughs> okay, great. Well, you know, in the seventies, Leonard Nimoy wrote a book titled, I am not Spock. And I think mm -hmm. people were upset with that. And then I think back in the nineties, he followed up with, I am Spock. So have oh, you wow. ever considered writing books that were either I am or I am not Bashar? My life as a telephone for an ET. <laughs> yeah, we joke. It's like, what? Not AT&T, but ET&T. <laughs> um, the strange thing, coincidentally, that you bring up Leonard Nimoy is um, he actually lived down the street from me when I was growing up wow. in West Los Angeles. So there was already that kind of connection there. So that was interesting. That is amazing. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing that if you live in that, you know, in that area... There's no telling who's going to live down the street from you. Exactly. We run into people now and then. Yeah. It's interesting. Well, before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? Absolutely. Again, I would highly encourage people to really act on their passion. It really does work. If you understand Bashar's formula and you apply it as precisely as you can, it really makes a big, big difference in your life the the effortlessness that comes with it the magic that comes with it is really what we all deserve and we really have to get over the idea that we're not worthy we're not deserving we're not good enough because we really are we're all aspects of creation we're all beautiful beings and we're all bigger than we think we are and following the formula is what allows us to experience that in our lives and truly be of service to others by being a living example of that joy 
So I would strongly encourage everyone to really be authentic, act on their passion, and live the best life they possibly can. It really does work. Daryl, thank you for your message, and thank you for being my guest. Thank you so much for having me. I really, really appreciate the opportunity to share this information through places like what you've put together. So I deeply appreciate you having these kinds of outlets so this can happen. So thank you very much. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.